My name is Sarmila Sriponeswara, and on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome all of you to Clinical Toxinology Webinar 2022. In collaboration with Remote and Renovation Consultancy Services, Malaysian Society of Toxinology, College of Emergency Physicians Special Interest Group, Clinical Toxinology, Emergency Medicine Student Association, National Poison Center and Malaysian Association of Medical Assistants. Thank you to the respective collaborators for the contribution in order to make it happen today. We, the committee members, are proud to be a part of the Clinical Toxinology webinar as this is our second year conducting it and expecting to continue our legacy in coming years. Without further ado, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Faisal Amri bin Hamza to start our event with welcoming speech. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Chairperson. Assalamualaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, <clears throat> I'm taking this opportunity today. I would like to express my greatest appreciation to all participants of the Clinical Toxinology Webinar. We cannot express how thrilled this is as we have all our participants today. And for your information, uh, I would like to salute the Students Association Persiap in organizing this uh, webinar series in collaboration with the elected bodies and professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, this program has over exceed the targeted participants in the, in the initial uh, plan of target. This is an incredible achievement. For that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone involved in executing this program and a big round of applause to everyone as participants. I hope you all will enjoy this program as much as everyone enjoying preparing it. Finally, I wish you the best for today's event and may all of you benefit from this program tremendously and we will continue this program in future years. With regard, I have officiate the clinical technology webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for the motivating speech. Before filling ourselves with knowledge today, let me introduce the panelists of our webinar first. Dr. Ruth Sabrina Bindisaferi is an emergency physician based at Hospital Raja Pumaisari Bainon, Ipoh Perak, qualified in special interest in clinical toxinology. Ministry of Health 2019, accredited from Hong Kong Poison Information Center, United Christian Hospital, Kowloon, Hong Kong. Dr. Zainal Abidin Muhammad Ismail is currently consultant of emergency physician in emergency and trauma department, Hospital Tengku Ampuan Hafsan, Kuantan Pahang. Qualified in special interest in emergency medicine, clinical toxinology, pre-hospital care and disaster medicine. Now, let's welcome our first presenter, Dr. Emilia Santa Maria, is an emergency medicine clinical consultant, Department of Emergency Medicine, University of Philippines, Philippine General Hospital, to enlighten us with the topic, marine animal envenomation and poisoning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. Today, we're going to discuss about the emergency response and management of marine animal toxins, poisoning and envenoming. As for our objectives, we will have an overview of the marine envenoming and poisoning and discuss the medically significant marine animal envenomation poisoning and in its clinical presentation. We, also we will also discuss the emergency response and management of this marine animal envenomation and poisoning cases. So whenever we are near bodies of water, such as the sea, the ocean, and lakes and rivers, we need to keep in mind that we are mere visitors because that's their home. So we need to keep give them the utmost respect. So what then are the marine creatures that causes envenomation? They are either invertebrates or vertebrates. Example of invertebrates are the far corals, the jellyfish, the cone snails, the blue ring octopus, sponges, and the echinoderms. The vertebrates are the stingrays, lionfish, stonefish, scorpionfish, and the sea snakes. 
There are two types of marine envenomation, namely penetrating and non-penetrating envenomations. Penetrating envenomations are caused by catfish, lionfish, scorpionfish, stingray, the stonefish, sea snakes, and the blue ring octopus. Non-penetrating envenomations are caused by the fire corals, hydroids, the blue bottle jellyfish, or the box jellyfish of the different species, namely Indo-Pacific Caronic species, Hawaiian Caribbean species, and Australian Caribbean species, which, which causes the Irukandji syndrome. The marine creatures that cause poisoning, on the other hand, <coughs> would be the histamine, scombrite fish poisoning, and ciguatera fish poisoning. What then are the basic principles that need to be considered in marine injuries? We need to promptly and vigorously irrigate cuts, remove all foreign materials, and we should never suture lacerations or puncture wounds sustained in a marine environment. Infecting bacteria are numerous and can vary with the environment, the type of injury, and the marine organism. We need to make sure that antibiotics are provided early as well as post-exposure tetanus prophylaxis. We need to obtain early surgical consultation and we have to have close clinical follow-up, import, more importantly, so that we'll be able to identify treatment failures early. We need to make sure that victims of marine animal associated trauma should be removed right away from the bodies of water, the body of water, to allow immediate resuscitation. There are, however, two trauma caveats to pay attention to. Teeth, spines may be retained in the bone and soft tissue, which can be a source of in infection. Mouths and integuments of marine fauna can be heavily colonized with marine bacteria. So what are the clinical manifestation when, when fire corals causes the injury? We may note pruritus, stinging pain, and erythema, erythema around the area. We need to, and then what can we do? We to as treatment, we can irrigate with seawater and saline, and we can apply topical corticosteroids. Mm. The jellyfish, on the other hand, apparently we have no over nine thousand known species, and one hundred of which are known to cause injury. Among the box jellyfish, the Indo-Pacific box jellyfish is the most this the most most venomous animal. Apparently it's the world's most venomous animal. So we really have to be very careful about this. The Australian box jellyfish on the other hand, the Karukia barnesi causes the Erukanji syndrome and the Hawaiian box jellyfish, which is the Caribia alata. <clears throat> um, box jellyfish is known to have a bell that grows to, to 25 to 30 centimeters in diameter, and there are about 15 tentacles per pedalial. 60 ribbon-like tentacles can grow longer than 9 feet. Hence, it is known to have the most explosive and explosive envenomation process presently known to humans. Yes, that's me. I almost got stung by this box jellyfish. Thankfully, I was wearing my rush guard and I was able to note the movement of this very venomous creature. So the mechanism that is um, causing the jellyfish thing is known to have nematocyst is the nematocyst which is along um, <clears throat> which is noted along the tentacles sorry excuse me which contains the snidae and the snidae are the organelles that are made of hollow barbed wire which barbed thread bathed in venom so um the discharge of the venom is in response to pressure in osmotic discharge this is the microscopic picture of this hollow barb, um, barb um, structure where the venom is discharged from. 
So what are the clinical presentation of the jellyfish sting? So we may note local effects such as severe pain in the area and purple-like, purple whip-like flare pattern with stripes of about 80, 8 to 10 millimeters wide. With more severe stings, we may be able to observe blistering that may happen and their superficial necrosis, which develops after 12 to 18 hours. As you may note, this is the patognomonic cross-hatch pattern, classically referred to as the frosted ladder pattern. So, what are the systemic effects that are observed? So, patients are observed to have nausea, vomiting, muscle spasms, headache, fever, and chills. Severe paralysis may also be observed, as well as syncope, and patient may go into respiratory distress, hypotension, and dysrhythmia. Reports of patient dying in few minutes are really known. The jellyfish venom has a cardiovascular effect, hence blood pressure elevation can be noted, which is usually transient, and then hypotension follows as well as cardiovascular collapse. Dermatonecrosis can also be observed as well as hemolysis and myotoxicity. This is the picture of the boy um, who succumbed to jellyfish sting um, in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, in Tacloban Leyte. Unfortunately, there was no antivenom that was available, hence patients succumbed. What then are the general guidelines for the treatment of jellyfish stings? So we need to deactivate the matosis. We need to remove the tentacles. And we should have reversal of the venom effects and give symptomatic and pain relief, as well as, also, as, well as also give standard resuscitative measures. That's why it is very important that healthcare workers along the coastal areas should be trained in basic like uh, in minimum basic life support and of course the most effective um treatment for the the box jellyfish would be the anti-venom that is not readily available so the portuguese man of war or the blue bottle jellyfish can also be treated by irrigating the area with seawater or saline we can remove the tentacles and nematocyst and do hot water immersion as well as application of topical lidocaine. We can also apply topical corticosteroids for the pruritus or itching and we observe for development of systemic symptoms, hence the importance of bringing the patient to the nearest equipped hospital. So for the box jellyfish, what can we do? We need to remove the tentacles and nematocyst, apply 5% acetic acid or vinegar over the area for about 30 seconds. And we can also apply topical lidocaine and consider hot water immersion in controlled environment. Topical corticosteroids can also be applied for pruritus and we need to observe for development of systemic symptoms. In box jellyfish sting cases, we need to be very alert in, and um, we should make sure that we can bring the patient right away to the nearest hospital so that he, just in case he would need supportive um, ICU care, <clears throat> supportive and ICU care. So what are the things that when we can do to prevent um, jellyfish thing as well as um, be, uh, be able to let the public know what to do in cases of jellyfish thing? So here are the steps which should, um, we should take. As previously mentioned, we need to take the patient out of the water. We should, not, um, remo we should remove the tentacles, but we shouldn't, use it, we, we shouldn't use our bare hands in taking out the tentacles. Um, because if um, this is not um, done, or if we do something else, the wet sand, by putting the wet sand, this can cause the stinging cells to release more venom into the body. 
So more importantly, we need to pour vinegar on the affected area for 30 seconds to stop the stinging cells from releasing the venom. And of course, as, said, as, as I have said, we need to remove the tentacles from the body using a towel, a glove, um, wearing um, a, a gloved hand, and use using a tweezer to remove it. And of course, get the patient to the nearest equipped hospital. So these are the posters that can be used to educate the patient in the prevention and treatment of jellyfish sting. We can also set up um, po um, post wherein vinegar will be available, readily available, and also information that the waters um, um, in the waters are marine stingers, and um, the readily available vinegar can be used in case of um, jellyfish stings. So this is the poster that. Um, was also translated in our local language, in our national language, so that people will be able to um, understand it better and um, they may be able to share it to the rest of, of their family members as well as the other people in the community. For the mollusk, one of the most important animal would be the gastropoda or the cone snails. And it has been known that mortality from the envenomation of cone snail is 68%, so that's quite high. Apparently, the cone snail venus contains 100 conotoxins and they act on the neuromuscular junction. And this cone snail, um, cone snail sting mechanism of envenomation is um, caused, uh, is, I mean, the envenomation the haloproboscis containing the tooth bait in venom is the one that is released onto the victim that's causing the envenomation. So what are the noted clinical manifestation of cone snails? Apparently they, um, they reported that it can range from mild to excruciating pain and the systemic effects observed were weakness of diplopia, muscle paralysis, respiratory failure, and of course cardiovascular the cardiovascular collapse that may happen. And we already know that deaths has, has been reported. So what can we do? We need to do pressure immobilization of the affected affected limb and we can do hot water immersion in controlled environment and of course um, we need to bring the patient to the nearest um, equipped hospital so that in case paralysis happen and respiratory failure happens patient may be may have the ICU um, care that they need so the blue ring octopus, as you will observe, they look so beautiful, but you should never hold it in your bare hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you may note one to two puncture wounds at the bite side of the of a blue ring octopus octopus injury injury in a uh, blue ring octopus injury, and usually minor discomfort can be observed as well as redness and swelling. However, there can be rapid onset of flaxseed paralysis and respiratory failure. Hence, the patient should be brought to the nearest equipped hospital as no antidote is available. We can also do pressure immobilization. The blue ring octopus venom contains the tetrodotoxin, tetrodotoxin. So that causes the paralysis. And apparently, the venom of the blue ring octopus can kill 26 adults in just a few minutes. So that's very dangerous. For the sponges, um, we will once if, if um, a victim sustained um, injuries from sponges, we will we will we may be able to observe edema, pruritic dermatitis, and local joint swelling in vesicles. And if we um, rewet dried sponges, they can be toxic even after several years. And we may able to see that eventually the skin findings or the skin injury may resolve in three to seven days. So the sea urchins, um, sea urchins injury 
can cause local reactions such as pain, burning, swelling, and redness. So what can we do for both sponge and sea urchins injury? So we can do hot water immersion. We can dry the skin gently and remove the spicules from the skin using adhesive tape. We can dilute 5% acetic acid or vinegar, soak the affected area for 10 to 30 minutes or 3 to 4 times a day, and we could use the ordinary rubbing alcohol. It's a good second choice. For the stingray, what can we do? We can do hot water immersion, apply topical lidocaine, and the, we can, of course, do the usual wound care and give tetanus prophylaxis. We can irrigate with seawater or normal saline, and we observe for the development of any systematic systemic symptoms. So it's really also important to bring the patient to the nearest equipped hospital. We can also assess for deep penetration with uh, from the stingray spines. So surgical consultation should be done. For the sea snakes, um, just like any other snake species, we can um, use pressure. Uh, we can do pressure immobilization. And of course, we can use the polyvalent sea snake antivenum for the systemic reaction in, uh, in case if it's av available. So we need also to be ready to treat any anaphylaxis from the sea snake bites. And of course, as, as has been several times, men has been mentioned several times in this talk, we need to bring the patient to the nearest equipped hospital so that we may be able to um, use IC, uh, to have ICU care for the patient because we need to observe for uh, possible myotoxic or neurotoxic manif clinical manifestations. For the stonefish, we need to have hot water immersion and we can apply topical lidocaine, of course the usual wound care. We can irrigate with seawater or normal saline and um, administration of stonefish antivenom if it's readily available. For the histamine fish poisoning, majority is caused by the tuna, the marnin, the salmon, and all the other fishes. So um, what is the uh, the very the important the importance of histamine fish poisoning? Um, we should make sure that it is not mistaken as food allergy. Uh, that's the reason why more often than not, fish as compared fish poisoning is under recognized, even with a prevalence of 2.5 percent relative to food outbreaks. So it is the most common of the ichthyotoxicosis worldwide. So usually what is observed um, would be allergic-like reactions and the, um, it can happen within 10 to 60 minutes. For mild um, mild uh, reaction or a mild um, scumbrite poisoning, we will observe warm sensation, body malay, headache, flushing, abdominal pain, dry mouth, spagia, and peppery taste and headache, um, as well as palpitations. So for severe injury, se severe presentation, high lightheadedness on your circope can be observed as well as ch chest tightness or respiratory distress or some so sensation of a lump in the throat. So it's important that patients should be brought to the nearest equipped hospital. For the Ciguatera fish poisoning, it is also a form of ichthyotoxicosis, and this is caused by the consumption of the many species of tropical and subtropical reef fishes from the Indo-Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea contaminated by ciguatoxins. So what are the vectors of ciguatera toxins? Believed to be vectors would be the grouper, the amberjack, the snapper, and the barracuda. So the clinical presentation of ciguatory, ciguatera to, uh, poisoning would be neurologic, gastrointestinal, and cardiovascular symptoms. And central and peripheral nervous system symptoms may also be observed. So there is swelling of the nerves and destruction of the nerves as well as chronic fatigue and myalgia as well as 
increased excitability of nerve terminals and temperature reversal. So cold feels hot, hot feels cold, uh, hot feels cold. So ataxia may be also observed. So what, what is then the pre-hospital management that can be done for sequoteria and scomboid poisoning? So very important would be the recognition of the life-threatening condition, which may be either manifested by this respiratory distress uh, observed in the patients to the from the mus neuromuscular paralysis and bradyarrhythmias. So we need to have supportive management in um, observing the ABCD, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. So we need to do cardiac monitoring. We can give oral rehydration with ORS solution. We, need, we can do clearing of secretions from hypersalivation and, of course, fluid resuscitation with crystalloids at 20 cc per kg for severe dehydration and hypotension. So um, we need to stabilize, we can give atropine for bradycardia, we can consider inotropes or temporary, fa temporary pacing if refractory. And when we monitor the hydration and electrolyte imbalance, of course, we can do decontamination. So we can consider single dose activated charcoal if the ingestion of large amount is observed or within one to two hours, and we should avoid antiemetics. The antidote for the scomprate poisoning would be the H1 blocker, such as the diphenhydramine, citrusine, as well as the H2 blocker, cimetidine, famotidine, and ranitidine. There is no rule, however, for corticosteroids except in area obstruction, anaphylaxis, and over overlap with seafood allergy. Antidote to ciguatera poisoning is not available, so it's not there's none that is that has been established. So we can give manito 0.5 to 1 gram per kg over 30 to 45 minutes within 72 hours, but with always with caution and BP precautions. So in summary, what should we do? We should not find panic and keep in mind the basic principles of marine injury, the clinical manifestations, and the treatment. And as we have mentioned, prevention and education is of great importance. And do not touch those beautiful creatures, however beautiful they are. And you should never do that randomly. And of course, we need to learn how to do CPR. So CPR apparently is as easy as CAB, compressions, airway, and breathing. However, because of the pandemic, um, we are just um, encouraged to call to do the CPR, the chest compression, and we can shock if the diff um, there is an AED, automated external defibrillator, that's available. So you will find more information in the um, in this website, as you can note, and then hopefully we will be able to just avoid all these injuries altogether. This is one of our early uh, activities, which is the first aid for marine envenomation CPR done in 2018. This was carried out in the community because a uh, uh, Filipino, Filipino Italian girl, seven year old girl succumbed to jellyfish things and the uh, livelihood of the fishermen and the tour guides were greatly affected. So that's all. Terry Makasi, join us. This is our email. We are the Philippine Toxinology Society. Thank you very much, Malaysian Tox Society of Toxinology. Good day. Thank you for the excellent video presentation from Dr. Emilia. Without further ado, let's move on to the next presentation by, by Dr. Aida Nur Sharini Bidi Muhammad Shah, Head of IIUM Poison Unit, Sultan Ahmad Shah Medical Center, International Islamic University, Kuantan Pahang, to present us with plants and mushroom poisoning. Let's welcome Dr. All right, uh, hopefully everyone is in a... Um having a good day today. It's very cool in Kuantan at the moment. Now, um, my topic is plant and mushroom poisoning. Both are quite heavy topics. Uh, hopefully, I do it justice in a short time, and hopefully, everyone learns um, 
from my session. Right. Oops. So these are my table of contents, uh, introduction, and then of course, just a brief look at poisonous plants in Malaysia. And, and of course, to focus on mushrooms. Right now, um, everyone knows, uh, well, we have plants around us. Um, we interact with plants a lot. However, uh, plants are like human beings as well, that they have their own physiology and, uh, and of course, defense mechanism and uh, a will to survive, right? So the question comes in, why are plants toxic um, or produce toxin? We will look at a case um, that we saw in our hospital. Uh, this 40-year-old man, uh, he came to the emergency department complaining of the uh, tip of his tongue numbness and feeling a bit nauseated. And then he was telling us that he was at his kebun or orchard and he was clearing up uh, some bushes and uh, rubbish and he found some uh, uh, he found a crawling type of plant and the plant had a very nice looking fruit it's very small it's very cute and i will show you the picture in a bit and he thought oh this this looks interesting so he called his mother before he even thought about anything he called his mother he said mom uh, what is this do you know what this is uh, because thinking you know the village uh, the elderly would know what kind of plants is there it's his mother's orchard in the, in, the, in the beginning anyway so anyway the mother says mm, you know uh, why don't you try and eat it <laughs> the mother didn't know what it was uh, but told his son why don't you try and eat it so he was like uh, okay you know it looks very innocent uh, so he licked it so that was what happened he licked it he didn't he didn't chew on it he didn't bite on it he just licked it and uh, um, he started to develop numbness the tip of his tongue a few minutes later and became nauseated and then subsequently, he said he had uh, difficulty breathing. He was having profuse sweating with headaches and giddiness. Okay, then he tried to wash out uh, the, the feeling with gargling copious amounts of water and coconut juice. Uh, I, I'm not really sure where that uh, came from, but it, the mother also told him to do that. Right? So this is what the fruit looks like. Okay, so this is magnified. It's very small, actually. It just sits in the palm of your hands, and it looks like a watermelon. <laughs> Right or a cantaloupe, and this is what it looks like when it cut up. Uh, this is the sample that he brought into us, and that's what we did. We cut up, and it looked like it had an avocado-like texture. Right? If you look at it, it looks like an avocado-like texture, and that's the seed. And this is the seed; it's uh, crushed. So when we queried him, he said, "No, he never bite into it. He he did not chew on it or anything like that. He just licked it." Then we asked him, "Did he use any pesticides? Because it might not have been because of the fruit itself. It could have been a pesticide." Um, that was sprayed on top, you know, to kill the weeds and, and whatnot. And he said, no, as far as he knows, he's never used any pesticide and his parents had not either, right? So this is, um, well, in Pahang, it's not a common occurrence, but it do happens occasionally. But of course, with mushrooms, uh, it's more frequent because mushrooms we know are edible, right? And they're very yummy, okay? We'll come back to mushrooms. But Let's go back to this patient. So this patient, um, he's 40 years old. He's male. He's also a smoker. And he says he has profuse sweating. He never complained of chest pain, but he has profuse sweating. And although we were thinking, okay, is this poisoning or is this maybe him having a heart attack? So we did an ECG anyway because it's a standard protocol that a patient comes in, you know, with uh, profuse sweating, giddiness. You know, it could be an atypical presentation of a, a acute coronary syndrome. And uh, um, well, this is the ECG, and uh, there is some funny looking um, findings in the uh, anterior septal area, right? It looks like the J point is slightly raised, so we were worried. Okay, so we, we didn't start him on any antiplatelets or anything like that, but we repeated the ECG, we, do, we did a cardiac enzyme. And both turned out negative, like the cardiac enzyme, the troponin was negative, and the ECG remained the same after several uh, re repeats. Um, and then we did an echocardiogram bedside echocardiogram also shows no signs of any um, regional wall hypokinesia. So we ruled out because troponin was negative, we ruled out it being an acute coronary syndrome and possible that he, it could be possible that there was a pesticide on top of the fruit. Now, if he had eaten or bitten into the fruit, then maybe it would have been a, a poisoned by the toxins of the fruit. Later, we went to see the uh, um, uh, I forgot what they are called. I'm the plantologist <laughs> here in UIE, and she looked it up. I forgot the name of the fruit. I, I should have included it. And it is poisonous, actually, but it's not enough to cause severe 
um, reactions in humans, right? Okay, so so why are these plants poisonous anyway? They look very harmless, like they don't go anywhere. Well, the crawly ones do. Okay, so it's actually just part of their physiology. It's sometimes an intermediate of the plant energy. Okay, it might not be functioning in any form, but it becomes poisonous to whoever takes up the plant or eats up the plant. And then it's also um, a probable incidental, incidental metabolic products. Okay, um, uh, plants are living matter, they have metabolic pathways and the byproduct of that could be poisonous as well. Okay, it could be an intermediate of, an, of metabolism or part of the excretory product of the plant. Now, why do they produce this? Again, it's part of physiology, the real reason, we do not know why. Okay, it could be to, to protect the plant because um, as we know, uh, we have this survival instincts right? Uh, the living organisms have survival instincts, so it's to protect the plant as, as defense mechanism, right? Okay, now th there are several classifications. I don't think we need to go deeply into it. This is a bio, this is not a biochemical class, right? But there are five classifications of how or, or what kind of toxins are produced. So there are glycosides, alkaloids, phytotoxins, photosensitive um, uh, materials, and also external irritants. Now glycosides, I think a lot of us are quite familiar with, especially the cardiac glycosides. And then there's also the cyanogenic, right? The alkaloids are soluble organic salts. And a lot of our mushrooms also produce alkaloids and that causes the toxic effects. And then there's a, there are phytotoxins who can, which can lead to GI irritation. And then the photo, photosensitivity type of toxins can cause primary or hepatogenic photosensitivity. And then you have your external irritants. Uh, the plants contain sap or wax that can irritate the eyes and skin. Right. Okay. Now, so some some examples in Malaysia, especially are the our you know friendly looking uh, neighborhood potatoes, right? And we eat this in abundance. You know, do we get poisoned by potatoes? Well, not really. <laughs> uh, we get uh, the fat, all right, and get a skinny heart disease uh, from it. But to get poisoned directly from the toxins produced by potatoes is quite rare, right? Of course, everybody knows. Uh, the dose makes the poison, right? Uh, in, in toxicology, in toxinology, that's what we talk about, dose. Okay, so in potatoes, they have glycoalkaloids, right? And, um, and then there are other examples like cyanide generating compounds in apricot seeds, even in your ubikayu, right? They have cyanide generating compounds. But again, you wouldn't get cyanide poisoning if you just eat like one piece, okay? And then uh, there are other uh, examples like enzyme inhibitors, like um, in lectins and soya beans, green beans, and legumes. In potatoes in particular, if you look here, this is, uh, you, I'm sure you've seen this kind of potatoes, right? You buy potatoes, you thought you want to cook them, but you didn't, you leave it in the fridge and they start to sprout. Now, from this sprout, the, the concentration of the glycoalkaloids is actually higher from the sprout and the eyes of the potato, if you know what eyes are, I'm, I'm sure if you, you know, pernah masak and pernah potong uh, potatoes, you know, oops, what uh, the eyes are. And this is the potato plant. And uh, from the potato plant, it's actually the flowers, the sprouts, that has the more concentration of the glycoalkaloids. You know, so God made it that you don't eat the plants, you don't eat the flowers, okay, but you eat the potatoes, which has less amount, all right? So this, this, the flowers has the most uh, highest concentration of glycoalkaloids as compared as to the tubers itself, right? And on the tuber itself, the sprouts and the eyes and the peels, you know, when you peel off the skin, these have higher concentrations than, than compared to the inside part of the potatoes, All right? So these are, uh, again, these are, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, uh, during the PKP, uh, everybody plants this because they have nothing else to do. And these are plants that are very easily grown. They can take care of themselves. They just need some water and they will just flourish. Right, so this first is pathos, this one. This is so easy. This is my mother's favorite plant, actually. She keeps them everywhere in the house because you don't even need um, soil. You can just put them in water and they just grow. Right, so pathos or we call it siri gardin. Okay, and this one is Diphenbachia. Ataupun kita panggil dia pisang tanah. And this, this one has the most unfortunate name. It's a snake plant. Uh, unfortunate because it's called the mother-in-law's tongue. Now, again, we don't eat all this. Usually it's for decorative purposes, but it can be poisonous to our pets. Right? But uh, alhamdulillah, my cats don't eat them as well. They, they just don't bother to eat them. All right? Um, anybody knows what plant this is? 
Can anybody guess? Anybody want to try? It's quite famous now. This plant looks very green, very pretty. It grows everywhere, especially in Kelantan and South Thailand, or maybe Thailand, Kelantan, Trangano there. No? Nobody wants to guess? Anybody in the chat box? Nobody wants to guess. Oh, somebody wants to guess. No. <laughs> okay, so this is Mitragina speciosa. Do you know this? Kratom, right? So we, yes. We will not. Yeah, yes. Okay. So you know kratom. Laju dia tahu kratom. I'm suspicious now. Anyway, so but we will not talk about Mitragina speciosa. This probably would need a whole conference to talk about this, right? But the focus of today is actually this, right? Um, mushrooms, and um, and why mushrooms? Because I think uh, because mushrooms are edible. They are edible. And therefore, there is a potential that you are exposed to non-edible mushrooms. Um, and there are edible and non-edible mushrooms, and there is, and only an expert would know which is which. I'm not a mycologist. I do not know how to recognize mushrooms. I only buy them off the shelf in the supermarket, right? But mushrooms are very, uh, favorite. it's a favorite. Uh, when I was in Australia, it's a favorite substitute for meat because it is kind of meaty. If you've eaten mushrooms, it is kind of meaty. Right? And, and, and they like to eat them and substitute them for meat. But you have to know that there are so many types of mushrooms. I think there are thousands types of mushrooms and it's a bit difficult. My first workshop on uh, mushroom poisoning, I remember Prof. Haldun uh, mentioning this, this proverb. I, I can't really remember exactly what the proverb said. I mean, Prof. Haldun may, may correct me. Um, he says that a brave, there is no brave um, mushroom collector alive. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> because uh, brave meaning that uh, uh, a brave mushroom collector does not really uh, a brave mushroom collector will eat any mushrooms, right? But they will not survive. I, I suppose that's what it means. So he he says that there there are, there are no no such thing as a brave mushroom collector anywhere in the world. They, they will be dead by now because they just eat it, right? And um, so it's important to know about mushroom poisoning, especially now. This season, where it's raining and it's damp, and you will see an abundance of mushrooms sprouting everywhere, and they're very cute, and you have a tendency to pick it up, and you know I want to eat this, right? So how do you recognize mushroom? Uh, there's, like I said, there are so many types of mushroom, and then they, it can cause a myriad of symptoms, and uh, it's like your toxidromes and like your snakes. You have some clinical syndrome that you need to. Um, identify in order for you to figure out what kind of mushrooms. So when you're talking to the mycologist or when you're calling up the poison center, you want to know what to describe to them in order for them to identify which mushrooms we're talking about, right? So then you need to know about what mushrooms, uh, I mean, the parts of the mushrooms, okay? So um, so this is a, a favorite of toxicologists when they talk about mushroom uh, poisoning. They, they share this picture a lot. Um, it's an old drawing by John H. Willis. Um, and here looks... The, there is a cap, okay? The mushroom has a cap and then it has gills and sometimes they have scales. These scales are actually remnants of, of, of part of the cap, uh, remnant parts, okay? The gills, um, if you can follow my, um, hang on, I'll use this. Okay, so if you can see, this is the cap, all right? And this is the gills down underneath the cap. And then you have the annulus, all right? And then you have the stipe or the stem. And then you have the cap, uh, sorry, the cup or the vulva, right? And um, the shape, the different types and shapes of these parts will be able to help you to identify the mushroom. Another part of identification is looking at the spore pattern. And we will look at that in a bit. So now the cap has, as you can see from before, the cap has different types, shapes. See, see the, the, and how the gills attach underneath sometimes make, uh, the cap shape different, right? So bear with me. This is going to be a bit uh, uh, academic, okay? So the cap, so can be visit like very sticky. It has a sticky top, right? And then it can be glutinous, slimy. I'm pretty sure some of you, if you buy mushrooms of the supermarket, sometimes you peel off the top part because the top part here can be a bit slimy. So you will peel it off before you cook them. Some are dry and smooth and scaly. Some are fibrous or warty. And cap margins, the margins of the cap, okay, can be inrolled, curved, straight, uplifted, and produce different kinds of shape to the cap. 
Okay, so you can see cylindrical types, conical, okay, and uh, the rest. All right, so that's the cap. Okay, then the gills are described by the attachment of the cap to the stock. Okay, and um, it has uh, different types of patterns. And uh, you can see it from here, you know. So when you want to describe the mushrooms to the mycologist to identify which mushrooms has caused poisoning, then you need to go through the uh, documents to see, you know, how to, how to describe, right? So there are many types of gills that you can see. Some looks like. This one looks like a honeycomb, right? It looks like a, it looks like those underwater, what do you call it? Batu Karang, this one, I think. The first impression that I had. Then you have um, uh, the usual stripes that we see from mushrooms. Like these are the ones that we usually see. Okay, this one looks spiky or tooth-like. So there are different types of gills and the, then you can describe them in order to identify them. And then you have the stipe. Also, the stipe has different color, size. It can change color. The position structure also can be used to describe in order to identify. Okay. And then you have the veil and the vulva. Right. So everybody knows this mushroom. It's famous, but don't eat it. This is an absolutely no, do not eat. Okay. So the veil and vulva, that's the veil here, this part here. And the vulva is the sac like at the bottom, at the base of the stalk. Right. Okay. It's a. It's it's actually a remnant of the annulus. Okay. Remnant of this annulus here. Right. Uh, so this is the one uh, that's extra. Like when I was gazetting in HDA, we had a case of a, a whole family: a mother, father, and a daughter who had mushrooms, and all of them had severe vomiting and diarrhea, um, with mild to moderate dehydration, and we had to admit them. And I remember that um, the when we referred to the toxicology group. Um, Dr. Khaldun, Dr. Anissa, and Dr. Zainal was telling me, okay, you need to do spot printing. And I'm like clueless because I've never done it before. So, but this is what they do. Okay. It's a very good way to identify species of mushrooms. And, and you can send the pictures to mycologists and to the experts, and they can help you identify what kind of mushrooms these patients have taken. Okay. So, what you do is so uh, you have two types of paper you have the white paper and you have the black paper as well. So, you can so you have the black paper and the white kind of paper, and then you put, uh, you place the cap of the mushroom. You can cut off the stipe or the stalk. You put the cap of the mushroom on the paper, gill side down, okay? Because the spores are mainly in the gills. So you put it gill side down, and you can see patterns from different types of mushrooms, and the color of the spores are different. Okay, you leave it for two to six hours for this to happen. And you for darker kind of, for darker kind of spores, you need that white. That's why you need a white and a black paper, right? Because if the spores are darker, it's better seen on a white piece of paper. And this can help to identify what type of mushrooms. Okay, so now when you get a patient um, that is presenting to you and you're suspicious of um, a mushroom poisoning, uh, for example, we had another patient that was discussed in the Rex group before in Kuantan. Uh, this patient works in a restaurant and the restaurant closes at 1 a.m. So he was just leaving um, the restaurant and he found some mushrooms at, uh, on a tree um, or well, near a tree outside the restaurant and he picked it up okay and cooked them you know and you're thinking you know you work in a restaurant why do you pick up mushrooms but that's what people do people pick up mushrooms they look good to eat <laughs> and so he then developed a uh, severe diarrhea and uh, was uh, presented to the uh, hospital to go right and what are you going to do when this patient comes in okay so you need to find out how many people the mushroom, there are several questions that you can um, uh, do as a risk assessment when, you're, when you're, you're doing a risk assessment of the patient. You're trying to find out what poison, what toxins, you know, uh, and whatnot. So you ask them how many people eat the mushroom, okay, who, who were they, how old are they, all right, and what was the time of ingestion to symptoms. This is clearly important because I will talk about this when we talk about the types, different types of mushrooms. Now, you will have to ask whether all of them got sick or just some of them. And then was the alcohol consumed, right? And then uh, was it eaten raw or cooked? And uh, were the mushrooms in good condition or already spoiled, right? And then you can also ask habitat questions. Like for example, like when you do a snake envenomation, right? You ask them, do they live near a swamp? Do they, are they up in the trees or down on the you know, ground? Okay, so it's the same as mushroom. So you can ask them, where does it grow? Does it grow on a tree on its own, right? Where exactly? Right in a yard, lawn, wild area, 
were the pesticides or herbicides. Now, this is important because the mushroom might not be poisonous, but the herbicides and pesticides are, right? So if there are trees nearby, what kind of tree? These are all will help the mycologist identify and tell you what kind of mushrooms, and then you are able to um, further manage. Of course. And then, of course, Okay, so now we are going into the different type of mushrooms. Okay, so bear with me a bit. It's a lot to take, a lot to remember. Uh, but again, if there are many references that you can look into. And of course, you can always call the poison centers and poison units for assistance. And of course, to also uh, include your mycologist in the discussion. Right now, the group one are the amatoxins, right? These are the most difficult to treat. Okay, 90% um, will lead to death due to the mushrooms. All right, so this is the... the, the uh, this is one of the type of mushroom. Okay, there's Amanita phylloides, Amanita ocreata, and then you have your Gallerina autumnalis. Okay, the, the, the toxin is stable to cooking. That means even if you cook, it would not be uh, metabolized or, 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 or changed into another type that's not poisonous. So, it's so even if you cook them, you can still get poisoning. So this, again, that's why I said this is a no. No, 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 absolutely not. Okay, right? And the toxins are amanitins and phyllotoxin, which will inhibit your RNA polymerase too. Okay, and they are reabsorbed by the distal tubules. Okay, so how do these patients present? There is a delay in the symptoms, right? Um, um, usually about six to 12 hours from the initial uh, symptoms, all right? And then you suddenly have uh, a deterioration, a sharp colicky abdominal pain, severe nausea, vomiting, you know, and bloody stools. Right now, um, the latent period will be about three to five days. Sometimes they develop symptoms later. Sometimes they develop recurrence of abdominal pain with jaundice, renal shutdown, liver failure, seizures, coma, and sometimes death. Right now, how do you treat them? Okay, so of course, uh, your decontamination process includes charcoal. Right, that's, that's, uh, that's because charcoal will help bind whatever else is left in the stomach, right? Okay, so you know this. This is what charcoal does for every other uh, poison as well. And then, of course, it's mainly supportive care. A lot of the plant poisoning is uh, supportive care. There are only several, a few that you need several uh, uh, specific antidote, I mean. Okay, so mainly supportive care with hydration, um, electrolytes, uh, monitoring, and also replenishing. Okay, now you may use penicillin G. It may displace amanitin, right? Because they have the same, they, com they competitively in, uh, bind to the same uh, receptors, okay? And then you can use silymarin from milk thistle, okay? Because these also have competitive binding to the same uh, membrane transport. Milk thistle, you can actually buy in the pharmacy. I think we've seen um, in uh, Guardian and Watson's before. Now, in severe, severe cases, you may need to uh, liver transplant. And so this is um, an example of Amanita phylloides and Amanita ocreta. If you look at Amanita ocreta, it looks like the mushrooms that you have seen in the uh, supermarket. Even Amanita phylloides looks like, you know, for us who are not experts, looks like any other mushrooms that looks on the supermarket, right? So these are mushrooms that are non-edible at all. They're very stable even if you cook them. So you cannot, should not eat them. Okay, so the other group is the group 1A, which is oral anine. Okay, right. Um, in US, there's so many, right? Uh, it, um, it causes severe tubular renal damage, right? Of course, and it causes acute kidney uh, failure. And, and then there will be discrete, decreased absorption of your water sodium uh, proteinuria. So that leads to proteinuria and glycosuria. Okay, then the toxin also inhibits RNA and DNA synthesis in the kidney cells. So how do they present? So they have mild gastroenteritis. It's quite a long latent period, sometimes 36 hours to 17 days. The symptoms include severe thirst, abdominal pain, chills and fever, and of course, progresses to acute renal failure because of its pathology, mainly uh, causing damage in the kidneys, right? Okay, some patients will develop chronic failure. This is about 50% of the case, which is quite high, and the recovery sometimes takes a long time. Okay, so the treatment, again, your standard decontamination. Patient might need hemodialysis depending on how much the patient has progressed. Okay, and, and of course, if it's so severe, you might need renal transplant. Now, using steroids, hemoperfusion, false diuresis have not been proven to improve the outcome. Okay, so it's supportive. Again, it's a supportive. And then if it's worse, worsening kidney function, you may resort to hemodialysis and transplant. 
right? Okay with me so far? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you would have forgotten the name of the other two mushrooms already, but anyway, um, let's move along. So the, the group two is the Musimol, the ibotanic mushroom. Okay, the Amanita muscarina, Amanita pantherina, Amanita gemmata. The toxin is ibotanic acid, which is metabolized to Musimol. Okay, so Musimol is actually a false neurotransmitter. It binds to GABA receptors, and of course, that would cause central effects, right? It would have effect on the serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline. So it appears to result in anticholinergic symptoms. Okay, so when the patient comes, they will have anticholinergic toxidrome like features. Okay. Sometimes they present, they might present with cholinergic symptoms because you know that uh, uh, must, uh, uh, you have the receptors are everywhere that you have your nicotinic and your muscarinic receptors, right? So again, how do you treat when patients uh, come uh, with a poisoning off from Amanita, from the Musimol ibotenic acid? It's a standard decontamination measure. <clears throat> of course, if the patient have airway issues, then you will need to support the airway and uh, support the hemodynamics, right? In um, life-threatening anticholinergics, of course, you can uh, attempt physostigmine, 0.5 milligrams to 2 milligrams, okay, uh, through slow venous push over five minutes. Okay, now when in life-threatening cholinergic signs, consider atropine. So you need to know your toxidromes. You need to you know your anticholinergic and cholinergic, which one, because this toxin can produce two kinds of toxidromes. Some, most of the time is your anticholinergic. Some will produce cholinergic kind of toxidromes. So you... So you need to consider uh, and you need to know the toxidromes that the patient present with, right? Okay. And then the third group is the monomethylhydrazine. Okay. The gyrometra and the helvella. Right now, if I find this anywhere, I, I wouldn't eat it anyway, right? Because they look very weird and or they don't look like edible at all. Right? But there are cases where patients have picked this up to cook and eat. Now, the toxin is gyrometrin. Um, which is hydrolyzed to MMH, monomethylhydrazine. This MMH has been found to be released, like when you're cooking the mushroom, it's released even in the steam. So the person who's cooking the mushroom can be affected, even if they have not eaten the mushroom. So they may be poisoned just because of inhalation of the steam, right? The steam, the hydrolyzed uh, monomethylhydrazine can, is found in the steam, okay? So... Um, so this toxin actually chelates pyridoxal phosphate and inhibits reactions with B6 is a cofactor. The clinical effects, again, the presentation has a long latent period, 6 to 12 hours, right? Then you will have the usual vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, weakness, and headache. Severe causes, in severe cases, you might have jaundice, tachycardia, vertigo, loss of muscle coordination, and seizures, all right? And the recovery is about 2 to 6 days. Treatment, again, Standard decontamination measures, okay, um, you can give B6 uh, at 25 milligram per kilogram over 15 to 30 minutes IV push, right? For methemoglobin levels, which are greater than 30%, or patients who present with symptomatic hypoxia, you can give methylene blue 1% <coughs> solution, right? Okay, so this is for patients on uh, with monomethylhydrazine poisoning, okay? Then you have your fourth group which is the muscarine, okay? The examples of muscarine is cleitocyte, omphalatus toxin, and the muscarine is the type of toxin which stimulates your postganglion parasympathetic fibers. Again, if you look at this mushroom, they look kind of familiar, you know, so you understand why sometimes people will pick up and eat them, right? So this muscarine toxin is slowly hydrolyzed by ester uh, your acetylcholinesterase. The clinical effects will increase salivation, perspiration, you know, uh, bradycardia, meiosis, blurred vision, right? Severe cases, you might have hypotension, bronchorrhea, and wheezing. These are the, um, the killer bees, the three killer bees, right? Uh, when you talk about the uh, sludge dumbbells, right? So these are the three killer bees, your bradycardia, bronchorrhea, and bronchospasm, right? So when the patient comes in, then of course, how you treat depends on how they uh, present. If they are in the life-threatening, um, if they present with life-threatening features, then you will have to, for example, if they come with uh, um, uh, unstable bradycardia, then you may have to resort to giving atropine or even pace the patient, right? And then uh, meanwhile, uh, be, uh, before even considering to remove the 
toxin, right? And uh, if they are having airway issues because of the bronchospasm and the increased lacrimation and um, uh, bronchorrhea, then you need to intubate the patient. So the, the, the exact treatment depends on the presentation of the patient. Okay, but the principles of management is to decontaminate, look at the symptoms, and consider antidotes if required. Okay, so for children, zero to two years, the atropine is 0 0.2 milligram, three to four years is about 0 0.3, and five to 10 years, 0 0.4, following your pediatric guidelines. And group five is the coprin, the coprinous atramentaris toxin, is coprin, the metabolite of which inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase. So ingestion of this is asymptomatic, okay, unless ethanol is consumed in the following two to five days. So that's why, remember in the beginning, when you are doing your risk assessment, you need to ask about alcohol consumption, right? Because uh, uh, ingestion of alcohol uh, can cause uh, uh, symptoms, production of symptoms, right? Okay, so the onset of symptoms can be two, 20 minutes to two hours after ingestion of alcohol together with the mushroom, okay? Symptoms include flushing of the face and neck, swelling and paresthesia of the hands and feet, metallic taste and tachycardia. Late symptoms include nausea, vomiting and sweating. Severe cases might present with vertigo, weakness, confusion, hypotension and arrhythmias. Again, treatment is the same. Decontamination uh, measures must be done, especially if, if it's within the one or two hours that they presented. Of course, symptomatic treatment you may have to resort to beta blockers or sedatives for anxiety in the tachycardia and, uh, of course, fluid resuscitation. Right? Now, group six is your psilocybin. I'm sure some of you may have heard this. This is quite famous, your psilocybins, your magic mushrooms. Right? So your psilocybes, your penelius, your gymnopolis. The toxin is called psilocybin and it's a metabolite of psilocin. The effects are serotonin and norepinephrine mediated. Okay, blue staining reaction aids in identification. Now, the clinical effects, the symptoms is quite fast compared to the other mushrooms, about 30 to 60 minutes. Okay, sometimes as late as three hours after ingestion, right? Okay, uh, um, of about 5 to 15 milligrams of psilocybin, which correlates to about 10 to 30 gram fresh weight of the mushrooms. And you can get hallucination, impaired judgment, hyperkinesis, laughter, vertigo, ataxia, that's why it's called magic mushroom, you know, because you start to have hallucination, laughter, right? And it can also cause muscle weakness and drowsiness. Treatment, again, decontamination um, uh, is not recommended, especially if patient is agitated and the GCS is not full, like there's some mental uh, de um, deranged mental status. So you might not want to give anything orally, you might want to uh, fast them at the moment, right? Excuse me. And then rest and reassurance in a dark, quiet room. Consider benzodiazepines for severe anxiety or if the patient develops seizures. Okay. The seventh group is GI irritants. I, I, I hope everyone is still okay and still with me. So the seventh group are the GI that causes GI irritants. Uh, chlorophyllum molybdites, agaricus. Okay. Uh, and xanthodermis, rusula emetica. So there is no specific and, uh, toxins that have been identified. Most mushrooms cause more symptoms when it's eaten raw rather than being cooked, right? Okay, the clinical features, uh, develop, developing of symptoms within 30 to 2 hours after ingestion. The symptoms are, again, usually it's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Sometimes you will get electrolyte uh, imbalances. Treatment, standard decontamination measures. Um, uh, be careful of your antiemetics and antivirals. They may have unpredictable interactions with your mushroom toxins. And that is my last slide. Right. So uh, if there are questions, I think we are going to discuss it at the end, right? Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, if you guys come to Kuantan, I will take you to a place where there's a really, really good um, mushroom burger. It's really huge, but it's safe to eat. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor, for the wonderful presentation. I hope everyone learned from the presentation and not let your curiosity poison themselves. Last but not least, let's give it up for Dr. Anas Amri bin Hashi, Emergency Physician, Re Remote and Animation Consultancy Services. Consultant will be presenting about land animal and venomation and poisoning. Let's welcome, doctor. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good uh, still morning. Yeah? Uh, 
to all uh, panelists and also to all the audience. Okay, so I'll be talking on uh, land animals and venomation and very briefly on poisoning. Okay, so uh, uh, my outline of my presentation will be a bit of introduction. I will be speaking mostly about snakes, uh, arthropods, bite and stings, and also lastly, uh, last but not least, animals poisoning. All right, so before we move on, we need to be clear um, uh, what are the differences between toxins, venoms, and poisons, because this terminology can be interchangeably uh, misquoted or misused. So toxins are basically a compounds produced by living organisms and are secreted by many, could be from microorganisms, invertebrates, and or, or plants. By venoms is actually toxins that are injected into another organism via specialized apparatus such as from the fangs, teeth, or stinger. And poison else is a toxin also that are consumed or passively exposed, or is either by touching, okay, over a period of time. So with this venomous organism or animals, which actually must have contained the specialized apparatus for example snake they do have fangs okay and then for the arthropods they have stinger for them to inject their, their toxins into another organisms it's either as a as a defense or attacking mechanisms okay so based on the national uh, poison center or our pusat rancun they quoted that uh, about 167 cases were consulted related to natural toxins over the past five years from 2016 and 2021. Okay, uh, let's talk about snake related and venomation. I won't be covering uh, really into detail on how do we uh, obtain history, snake bites, uh, one by one step stepwise approach on uh, approaching snake related injuries, because uh, uh, I think KKM has already come up with a very, very good uh, guideline on uh, management of snake bite uh, in 2017. But what I will do, I will just give a brief overview on uh, a certain snake related envenomation. Okay. So in Malaysia, I think these are taken from uh, what, uh, Rex uh, presentations. Okay, uh, most, uh, I think the top five or six most common venomous snakes are consulted in the Rex uh, groups are uh, the uh, Naja Sumatrana, I think one of the highest, followed by the Naja Kautia and the pit vipers, Malayan pit vipers, Calosalasma rhodostoma, and also your mangrove pit, uh, pit viper, and also your uh, Topodermus subadunulatus or in Semenanjung is uh, Topodermus wagleri. Okay, these are the five. Most commonest, uh, most common uh, species uh, that cause uh, uh, snake-related injury or uh, envenoming. Okay, so what are the main challenges that we face? Okay, either uh, from the uh, uh, healthcare provider or even uh, from the victims. So we are still talking about some inappropriate uh, safety or health-seeking behavior from the victims or at the pre-hospital care level, okay? And we have to admit that our level of knowledge and, uh, and awareness among healthcare providers on diagnosing clinical syndrome related to snake bite and also the management of the patient with snake-related injury in certain areas are still uh, beyond uh, standard, uh, still below standard, okay? However, with, with uh, actively uh, uh, webinar like this and also actively uh, teaching, and uh, awareness created among the courses uh, conducted by the, the RECS group, the M Malaysian Society of Toxinology, uh, have improved uh, the, the, the level of uh, knowledge and management. Okay? We also still uh, lacking some of the uh, anti-venom, especially in the very remote area. Uh, not many of the uh, uh, district hospitals, we are still sometimes, they are not keeping uh, relevant or adequate anti-venom to cater for their uh, snake related bite, uh, snake bite patients. And of course, if you Google up our data or epidemiology on snake bite uh, in Malaysia, they are still uh, limited, okay? But I believe uh, Prof Kaldun and uh, other Rex uh, consultant uh, 
are actively uh, doing researches and study okay to 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 uh, to enlighten us uh, uh, the Malaysians regarding the snake related injury okay these are one of the challenges okay let's say we as the healthcare provider as the doctor who who, who encounter patient with snake bite okay so the, the victims or the the the, the relative of the, the victim kill not just kill they they, they they cut they chop off they even burn the snake okay this also some of the things that sometimes can can make the identification process of the snake a little bit challenging okay however sometimes uh, uh, experts like prof dr zainal and and all the senior consultant they still will manage to to uh, identify even though we are very distorted Next sample. Okay. Okay. We are still uh, snake bite victims, and the families are still practicing uh, some uh, inappropriate uh, uh, initial first aid. Okay. For example, on the left of the screen, they applied a multiple layers of uh, tourniquet. Okay. They apply all sort of ointments, all sort of traditional uh, applications on the on the on the bite wounds. On the lower bottom is a, is actually turmeric on, applied on the right hand, and they are still doing uh, incision and even cupping eh, on top of your of your uh, bite wounds. Okay, these are not actually recommended even in the WHO guidelines uh, of managing snake bite as management. They they even mention most traditional first aid methods should be discouraged because we are doing more harm than good. For example, when you do cupping incision, you can introduce more infection. You can cause bleeding unnecessarily. Okay, and when you apply all sort of ointments, uh, sometimes it can mask, it can uh, obscure the, the the view of the exact wound uh, that that can have a uh, dermonecrosis underlying it. And tonique, of course, we know uh, very tight tonique can affect uh, the assessment of the swelling and also can 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 cause a false uh, elevation of your ck levels okay. so mst with rex have come up with this a simple but very useful uh, poster that uh, highlighted the don'ts and do's uh, for the snake bite victims okay uh, although it's easier said than done uh, to calm down patients or victim is not really that easy, but however, it is really uh, helpful in minimizing the 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 subsequent uh, envenoming, okay, and application of your immobilizer, and also what what is we encourage really is to bring to the uh, hospitals or health healthcare facility as soon as possible, and the five don'ts that we 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 really discourage people to do. To bring to the snake charmer or bomo, eh, to suck the wound, to to suck, uh, to incise the wound, to massage, to tonique, and to apply some herbs medications. Okay. okay. Another challenging, uh, even amongst the doctors, among the uh, healthcare provider, is whether we are able to appreciate the clinical syndromes of envenomation because we know. The earlier we pick up or we detect the clinical syndromes, even sometimes without a clear-cut identification, uh, most of the time, majority of the snake bite cases consultations, the, the snakes are unidentified. They cannot identify. They just can tell it's a black snake, uh, roughly about one arm length, uh, sometimes raising the head, uh, sometimes with hood, hooded or non-hooded. Okay. So, but with a specific or characteristic for example like these two these two pictures on the left uh, visible dermal necrosis this is actually the same the same uh, kit bitten by naja species although there's no there's no snake uh, uh, were, were, were taken i mean the, the the snake identification were done but we can tell that most likely this is a uh, uh, bitten by a naja species as uh, as demonstrated by the dermal necrotic changes you can see over the over the time, the the demonicotic area becoming uh, enlarging, and also with development of the blister. Okay, and we also need to pick up early uh, neurotoxicity uh, and venomation. For example, patients started to develop 
toss fish okay uh, following a uh, uh, snake bite uh, envenoming okay and at the bottom there you can see very dark color urine this is a case of uh, apa? Uh, sea snake bite and venoming okay and then i think require uh, anti venom uh, but i think this patient survived although the ck went up i think i think hundred of thousands okay. then the other the other common clinical syndrome of snake bite and venoming is your uh, bitten by your green pit viper or malayan pit viper Okay, like this case is actually trimesterous bonensis, a case in Sarawak. Okay, where patient come in with massive swelling. Okay, we subsequently develop a hemorrhagic blister. Okay, over the hands. Okay, with this and then collectively with the uh, picture or the dead sample of the snake get okay, uh, brought into the ED, so we can we can predict that this patient could be developing a local and possibly a systemic envenoming as noted by the results. Subsequent result, you see the platelet going down trend, the APTT and INR, the PT start to become deranged. Okay, and we must know with this collectively looking at the patient's uh, bitten side with the snake uh, identified. So we know already our treatment should be going towards anti-venom. And still some of the cases that we encounter, you are still administering uh, IV vitamin K and I. Uh, uh, transfusing FFP instead of uh, giving the antivenom, which should be the first line yeah, in managing the envenomation uh, from the hematotoxic uh, snake. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Although snakes, uh, some of the snakes, uh, like in Malaysia, we only have so far one species, which is our Naja Sumatrana. Although uh, sometimes it doesn't bite, but it can also cause a significant uh, venom ophthalmia by spraying the venom into the eyes okay so patient can come with very severe red uh, uh, red uh, eye okay uh, associated with uh, sometimes blepharospasm uh, eye discharge okay this is a characteristic of your venom of thalmia and with uh, something some ten center they do have uh, morgan's land this can facilitate a copious amount of uh, irrigation uh, water irrigation over the eyes affected eyes yeah. all right the next uh, dilemma that we we, we usually face uh, i mean among the uh, snake bite patient is compartment syndrome we always see the plan one of the plan uh, noted in the in the highlight is to rule out compartment syndrome by referring to orthopedic uh, uh, team uh, this is even sometimes being done at the very beginning encounter with snake bite patients. Okay, because we know snake bites, uh, uh, venoms can cause a very significant cytotoxic effect. So what you can see, you can you can see a very rapidly progressive uh, swelling over the bitten limbs. Okay, though though advisably not to write on patients' uh, limb, but this is just to to demo to demonstrate. The, the significance of the expanding uh, proximal progression of the swelling. So this this cytotoxic or uh, envenoming or local envenoming can be mistaken as envenoming uh, as, as compartment syndrome, whereby it's actually not not a compartment syndrome. It's actually a local envenoming syndrome as a result of cytotoxic effect of the venom. So the management is actually uh, uh, adequate antivenoms. Uh, I've seen we have encountered sometimes the antivenom was not given adequately, time was not given adequately, but patient was subjected to premature uh, fasciotomy, okay? whereby it, it can be avoided by giving uh, appropriate or uh, adequate antivenom. Okay? Uh, but if in, in any doubt, uh, by right, uh, there should be an objective uh, assessment or supported by the uh, measurement of your ICP or intra compartmental pressure. Okay, although not many ED, not many hospital do have the the device, but it's actually recommended. Or nowadays, you what you can use, you can use uh, apa, uh ultrasound of the limb to mark or uh, to assess the extension the level of your edema. Okay, so hopefully we can we can with with more awareness with more knowledge. We can prevent or avoid this unnecessary 
premature or, or, or uh, uh, too early surgical debridement or even fasciotomy. Okay. As I said earlier, uh, the ultimate uh, decision or manage in managing a snake bite and venom is your antivenom. So we do have a list of antivenom, although not all hospitals have all the, 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 the antivenom in the list, but we do store what, whatever uh, relevant to the snake that, that, that center have based on our geolocation or geographically uh, significance, the uh, snake related to that particular area. For example, in Sarawak, we don't have Malayan pit viper. So most of our cases uh, enough uh, can be treated with green pit viper. So there's no point keeping malign pit viper. Okay. And then for the cobra antivenom, it can also uh, cross totalize uh, Naja Sumatrana, uh, even though it's, it's, uh, it can, can treat both Naja Kotia and Naja Sumatrana and venomation. Okay. So um, choosing the right antivenom, giving the right doses of antivenom at the right particular instance at the right particular time is really important. Okay, and can prevent significant morbidity or even mortality. Okay. All right. Over the years, I think uh, with Rex data that we have, uh, this average snake bites uh, uh, consultation that we receive is almost about one thousand per year. I think for the past three years, we all we always have about nine hundred fifty to almost one thousand per year, and it's been static, and we expect. Though there are more, still more underreported uh, snake bite cases. Okay. All right. Next, we move on to the arthropod sting and bite. This is also quite a new. Uh, I mean, some of us might not be familiarized, including myself also. But, but it's a. a uh, I will give an overview and a little bit of uh, example of the arthropods, venomous arthropods. Okay. So from the uh, National Poison Center, uh, I mean. We do have some classifications. There are a lot more. There are, there are some more of the classification. But these three most common that we encounter so far, we have a class of arachnida, which comprise of uh, scorpions, spiders, class of insecta, hoder, hymenoptera, okay, where, where we have hornets. Uh, we do have uh, cases of hornets, even a mortality as a result from the hornet sting, wasps, bees, and ants, and also uh, not uncommon, a centipede bites. Okay. So out of the 167 uh, cases that uh, recorded by the uh, Pusat Racun Negara from the over the past last five years, about 22% about are related to your venomous arthropods. Okay. So the first group that we are talking is uh, scorpions. So worldwide, we have about 100 at 1,500 1, venomous species. So out of this, about 75 species are dangerous to humans. Okay. Uh, the more little species are from the butidae, which is the yellowish brownish color. Okay. The effects of the envenomation is actually based on the depend, uh, uh, more uh, species specific or species dependent. And uh, for scorpions, their venoms usually quite rich in neurotoxins. However, we are lucky uh, so far up to date, scorpion in Malaysia has just merely caused local sharp pain, swelling, numbness, and paresthesia of uh, the limb. More or less, it's just a local effect. Okay. All right. So uh, the, the, the picture earlier that I showed is actually a black uh, scorpion, common encounter, heterometrous uh, longimanus. Okay, it's uniformly black, about 12 cm long, okay, excluding the, the claws. Okay, it's usually found in the jungle and, and underneath the logs. Okay. So uh, another two uh, more common, uh, common uh, scorpions of Malaysia, we have spotted house scorpion or isometrous maculatus. This can, can have a very uh, a severe uh, pain, severe sting among all Malaysian scorpions. The, also the size is quite small but it can cause a very significant, uh, uh, severe sting, okay? And uh, the third one is actually your wood scorpion. Yeah, can't really, uh, I mean, you can, because the color is a bit uh, not clear. So, Homorus uh, australasia is the most abundant and smallest uh, species of scorpion in Malaysia. It's less than 3 cm, it's black and flattened, 
okay, it shares the same habitat as the black scorpions. Okay. So management of your scorpion bite usually are symptomatic. Pain relief is crucial. Some advocates the use of uh, uh, cold compression, although, however, the, the evidence base is not that, uh, I mean, it's not that uh, evident based, but it's, it's sometimes it works. Okay. So most of the time, uh, most of the literature or guidelines do recommend the use of cold compressions. Okay. So far, we are lucky we have no severe envenoming uh, from the scorpion sting in Malaysia. And hopefully not uh, we, because we still don't have the anti venom uh, in Malaysia. Some country like uh, India, I think Israel, they do, have, they do keep uh, anti venom for scorpion. Okay. Okay, the next uh, class of the arthropods is uh, your spider. Okay, so spider, uh, not uncommon. We do uh, see consultation in the rex group. Uh, we have at least about 200 uh, out of the 30,000 species worldwide that can, can, can implicate uh, significant effects to the, the victims. Okay, most of the toxins are... Uh, 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 like the, the, the scorpion, they are species specific. Mostly they can cause neurotoxic or cytotoxic. Uh, in Malaysia, I think most of the, the, uh, the, the spider bite are, are, are uh, 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 causing local, local effects only. Okay? So on the right, on the left bottom uh, is actually your tarantula, your megalomorph. Okay? This is the largest species. And the harriers, this, this all harriers is actually uticaric, uh, uticatic, uh, it can cause uh, allergy, trigger allergy reactions. Okay. Um, the, the right bottom one is actually, uh, there are more and more reported uh, encounter is your brown widow uh, spider. This is also uh, can cause a significant pain and uh, local envenomations. And also, we also have reported cases with our share letter. Okay. So your brown widow spiders bite can cause local pain, uh, profuse uh, sweating at the bite site. It can cause pilo erections, uh, nausea, vom non-specific symptoms like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. This is also can be caused due to your uh, hyperventilation sometimes. It can cause fever, myalgia, arthralgia, and in, in rare cases reported to uh, patient be, uh, bite by the spider can, can have agitation and even Priapism. Okay. Okay. These are the two uh, confirmed uh, uh, spider bite uh, by the uh, Electrodictus uh, geometricus, our brown uh, widow spider. Okay. So one, I think both victims, uh, they, they, they were bitten while trying to wear their motor, motorcycle helmets. So the spider built their, their sarang in the, the helmets and then uh, the nest. So uh, it causes a pain uh, over the bite area, okay? And then the, the dead specimens were confirmed and then sent to the, your, your uh, uh, I think UM, uh, Department of Para Parasitology in UM is confirmed by the DNA barcoding, okay? Another uh, uh, huntsman bite or our Telticopis spider. Okay, these are two reported cases, I think, uh, one in the, I think it's one is 57 year old lady, okay, was bitten over the finger and uh, causing excruciating pain and also uh, significant swelling, okay. So, and then another, another guy is 42 year old, uh, also bitten on the, on the finger, okay. So, all these are observed over the 24 hours. However, I think one of the lady uh, developed a uh, uh, generalized atraja and uh, malja, okay. Uh, but however, there there uh, subsequent follow up. Uh, the patients improved and were discharged uh, back home. Okay. Here you can see uh, a specimen analysis of uh, telecopies. You can see the figure number three, uh, the fangs and morphology of the female uh, or copulatory organ. Okay, is a fangs. Okay, two two black fangs. Right. Okay, this is a case, uh, although the Pocilotaria regalis is not indigenous in Malaysia, but this one, the case encountered in Sarawak also. 
So this guy uh, uh, bought the spider as a pet. So and in one of the shop. So this spider is imported from the India. So causing uh, bite, just a minimal uh, local pain and erythema over the thing. Okay. So again, management uh, for spider uh, and, and scorpion mostly asymptomatic treatments. If patient develops uh, uh, allergic reaction, so you may administer antihistamine, steroid, and adrenaline uh, if, if very severe anaphylaxis. So, how, and then as, as for scorpion, for spider, antivenom also not available in, in Malaysia. Okay. All right. So, the next class of uh, arthropods, venomous arthropod, is insect star. Okay. So, there are three main uh, subgroup your Vespidae. Uh, true wasps, your epidae, your bees, and also your formicidae, your ants. This is your, your uh, what you call the uh, uh, Charlie ants, eh? Charlie ants. Eh? Okay. So the one that we always encounter, unfortunately, some fatalities uh, over the years. I think every year we encounter uh, victims uh, of uh, Vespidae, uh, Vespa affinis, okay, uh, stings. Okay. As you can see, the hive of Vespa affinis. Okay. So you can see usually the is is it can be is slightly a smaller smaller version of your uh, Vespa tropicana, okay, and then the, they call it uh, a Vespa affinis, okay. For bees, we have humble uh, honey, and and uh, bumblebees, okay. The difference between uh, wasps and bees, usually wasps causes uh, uh, wasps are more aggressive than the bees. Uh, and then it can cause uh, multiple, uh, it can sting multiple times. As compared to bees, bees usually they can only sting once. And most of the bees, after they sting, they die after they sting. They release the stinger and subsequently they die. Unlike the wasps, which is the, especially the Vespa, the Vespidae, when they sting, they can uh, sting repeatedly. And then it causes more envenoming or more hypersensitivity reactions. Okay. This is the difference. If you zoom in into your stinger, comparing wasps and honeybee. Okay, wasps, honeybee, you know, they have a bit of uh, what we call a valve or something. Uh, so, so when, when they sting, usually it will be left over at the sting site. Okay, as compared to the, the, pep, uh, the wasps. Okay. okay, this is unfortunate. Uh, Victims of, of uh, hornet stings, Imkanga, uh, all thing, most of, I think all of them, uh, two of them uh, occurred in 2020. And what I want to highlight to you is if you could see the, this is, I think, the case for Mosquito Colacra. I think Dr. Shukudin encountered this, this uh, unfortunate uh, victim where uh, it was stung by about more than 200 hornets okay, in Guam Musang. The, the southern part of Kelantan. So you can see at the, over the sting site, there are actually quite a distinct uh, necrotic area, some sort like uh, dermal necrosis, you know, when, when we encounter in the uh, Najah species bite. Okay, this is actually because all these uh, uh, wasps, they do have a lot of uh, enzyme protein uh, peptides and they can cause a lot of effects. Okay, so. Um, Locally, they can cause, uh, because it's a mixture of substance, including small peptide. And most, mostly, they do have histamine, and there are many more, I mean, uh, peptidase, eh, hyaluronidase, that can cause significant uh, uh, cellular effect. Okay? Locally, they can cause very stinging pain, swelling, redness, plus minus your necrotic area. Most of the Vespa epinis uh, that we encounter, they do come with a necrotic uh, changes over the sting site, okay? Whereby in systemic effect, uh, including your hypersensitivity reaction, patient can come with a, a urticaria, a generalized urticaria, acute dyspnea, shortness of breath, wheezing because of the bronchospasm. They can have nausea and vomiting as a, as a vague uh, symptom or even as a result of your uh, sympathetic uh, stimulations. Uh, they have diarrhea, and low BP, uh, even they can come with uh, altered conscious level and ultimately can, can cause uh, death. Okay. 
Okay, why? Because all these uh, venoms uh, and, and all these substances, uh, small peptide, causing, attacking uh, a lot of our organs or physiological functions. Okay, they can cause acute kidney injury, uh, acute hemolysis, rhabdomyolysis, also causing uh, acute kidney injury. Even there are reported cases of uh, coagulopathy. I think the one in Kelantan, uh, uh, they develop coagulopathy. Uh, liver failure with transaminitis, and some uh, several cases do have uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmia reported. Uh, for example, heart blocks. Okay, and ultimately all these can lead to multi-organ failure and causing uh, uh, mortality as a result of the massive uh, envenoming or severe hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, so our management always A, B, C, D, E, as for other emergency life-threatening cases, resus and resus. Uh, if you could remove the stinger and count, a stinger and count, okay, uh, adequate analgesia, opiates, uh, plus minus your call compression, again, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, uh, guidelines do recommend call compression, though the, the evidence base is still um, unclear, okay, the efficacy is still unclear. Adrenaline, if patient come with uh, anaphylaxis, severe allergic reaction, your first line is actually your IM adrenaline. And if patient develop uh, hypotension because of the significant vasodilators, vasodilatation, so you need to give fluids, uh, uh, resuscitation. And when the, whenever patient develop uh, acute hemolysis, uh, leading to hemolytic anemia, or, or even a coagulopathy, uh, complicated with bleeding, then you need to consider blood transfusion or even a dialysis in patient with a severe acute uh, kidney injury. Okay, so ANS, okay, ANS, this is a Charlie ANS, I think the solenopsis in Victa, okay, uh, it, the, the venoms from the ANS contains uh, peptides and alkaloids, uh, which is a solenopsin and piperidines. These alkaloids can cause uh, a development of this pustule uh, formation. Though sometimes it's not, it does not develop immediately, that can it develop over hours or over days. Okay. And also it can trigger uh, uh, allergy or anaphylactic reaction. Okay. Management is also symptomatic treatment, but you do need to consider uh, uh, antibiotics uh, as a result from the uh, extensive. Sometimes you can have a very bad papules with uh, infections. Okay. okay. Centipede. Right, uh, centipede. Some species uh, can be dangerous to humans. Usually, they come in with very excruciating, excruciating pain, uh, and then market swelling uh, with chills, fever, and and sometimes a generalized weakness. Okay, but uh, thankfully, it's, it's unlikely to be fatal. Okay, this is uh, but you need to watch out if if the 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 bite is the centipede. But it's over the, the uh, I mean, involve the small children, babies. Sometimes they were uh, sleeping on the floor, okay, uh, stinging, uh, uh, got bite by the centipede. So it may possess a, a, a greater risk of complications. Eh? And then for those who, who had underlying history of allergy, uh, uh, high risk of allergy, okay. And uh, you also not to, not to uh, watch the, the, the side of the, uh, bites, okay, be turned over the face, especially over the mouth, neck, is also carry higher risk as compared to uh, be turned over the limbs, okay. So, my management is the same for others, uh, atropod, general first aid, again, cold compressions, uh, adequate analgesic, and uh, your, your allergic uh, treatment, antihistamine, steroids, uh, even your adrenaline. This is uh, one of the species uh, available in Malaysia, scolo, uh, scolo Scolopendra species. Uh, I think in Malay we call it Lipan Bara, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. okay. Lastly, uh, animal poisoning. I try to look hard uh, for, uh, for literature uh, about the uh, animal poisoning, land animal poisoning. Mostly the animal poisoning uh, 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 due to the marine animals. But however, uh, they are, they do, we do have land animals poisoning mostly from the amphibians, from the frogs, newts, toads, and also salamanders. Okay, because they are, they are equipped with the defense mechanism. Okay, so they, they have this potent toxin, which they produce 
uh, which contain including digoxin, tryptamines, and also tetrodoxin. Okay, this can cause a variety of symptoms such as uh, irregular heart rhythm, arrhythmia, dizziness, or even cardiac arrest and paralysis. Okay, and furthermore, frogs and toads are also known to spread salmonella to the humans. However, uh, we are we don't have that much data on land animals poisoning. Uh, not not that I found uh, online or, or or from my research. Okay, All right. I think with that uh, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anas, for delivering your knowledge on envenomation for today's webinar. Thank you to all presenters for kindly accepting to provide us with numerous knowledge and skills to be applied as a medical personnel today. Anyhow, most importantly, we hope everyone benefited from today's webinar. Okay, for the next, we will be heading to the Q&A session. For this session, I would like to specially invite Nurul Iza as our moderator of this webinar. Passing to you, Iza. Thank you so much, Samila Sri. So for the first question we got is, what is the rate of jellyfish exit incident in Malaysia? Um, actually, for uh, in Malaysia, we do not have the compulsory reports for each of the uh, envenomation or poisoning cases to any of the um, um, respected uh, poison information center. So uh, what we have now is um, case reports, isolated case reports or case series. And uh, I would quote one of the paper from uh, published in 2021 uh, by Dr. Um, uh, um, I think um, um, Amani, is it? Um, and Kim uh, from UKM, uh, Master Students, uh, with estimation of local incidence of jellyfish envenomation in developed uh, marine coastal area and large populated island. Uh, so the data is from the Manjong, Pera and Nakawi Islands. So we can see over here uh, for the uh, one year period in uh, 2020, 2020-2021, there are about 45 cases and with heavy uh, incident rate, uh, he heavy incidents in the uh, month of November, December and February. Uh, and uh, they are analyzing the data about the um, uh, um, the, the uh, the cases and um, actually the presentations and what are the first aid that being um, that being applied over there. So uh, exactly, uh, we do not have the overall data for Malaysia it comprises of Minister and Sabah Sarawak. But um, all in all, actually, I would say that every um, um, uh, island in Malaysia have got uh, certain uh, cases that uh, they have encountered, uh, and I think Sabah has one of the highest um, uh, cases that I encountered. Yeah, that's from me. Uh, I would like to add on a bit on that, uh, that uh, those cases that is consulted to Rex, uh, we can analyze them because we have the data, but uh, we, can, we can say that all the cases that uh, happened in Malaysia is consulted to Rex. So uh, the data that we have from the Rex consult can actually help us uh, sample or comment on the samples uh, of cases that we encounter in Malaysia and hopefully that will uh, be helpful when we analyze the data. So we are in the process of doing so. So hopefully we can get some of this data published. Uh, so yeah. So we always encourage people who have cases of uh, jellyfish sting or any uh, toxin related injuries to consult Rex uh, in their respective hospitals. That will be helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Thank you for providing my Next question that I find interesting is Is there any local for local LA for scientific bite of scorpion? Is there any local LA for scientific bite of scorpion? Can I have Dr. Anas on this? Sorry, oh, I need to mute, uh, unmute. Okay, okay. All right, uh, local LA. Uh, some guidelines do uh, advocate, I mean, do mention about the, the use, usage of the local LA, like IB, Bupi, uh, and etc. But um, 
for me, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's a bit difficult for, for about assessing the uh, uh, progression of the pain. Uh, but however, uh, yeah, yeah, to answer you that there are uh, recommended uh, usage of the IV, IV uh, uh, local anesthetic in, in, some, in some guidelines. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Anas. But that, that one is, I think, uh, for intractable pain, right? Yeah, yeah. For, you, for, you for try, long pain, yeah. Yeah, you try first with uh, at least, uh, depending on the severity of pain, uh, on the choice of analgesia that you use. Uh, obviously, for intractable pain means that you have already come up with uh, opiates and so on, but still the pain is very severe, then you may consider local anesthetic. That is also applicable to, uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, marine uh, stings as well, right? Uh, uh, for example, the uh, scorpion fish and so on, uh, uh, or stonefish. Yeah. So we we don't use directly local and <laughs> local anesthetic to to control pain. Yes, it will be it will be effective, I think. But that's kind of an overkill to the uh, to the perhaps uh, an uh, arsenal of uh, analgesia that we have. The, the symptoms we are self-limiting, right? To give it according. Yeah. Uh, it can be, but then if it is prolonged and it's yeah. not responding well to the opiates that you give, then you may consider local anesthetic. So uh, for centipede, the question is, uh, yeah, we've, 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 we've given uh, even some uh, uh, steroids and also antihistamine to patients and they, they seem to be working well with the oral analgesia that we give or even IV analgesia that we give. So uh, may not necessarily need a local... I was wondering about uh, whether we've tried submersion uh, for centipede pain. I mean, immersion, not submersion, sorry. Immersion in warm water for the, for the centipede bites. Uh, not from our experience. I'm not sure about the Philippines though. I don't know. The venom is it hit hit lebar or hit? Uh... <laughs> no, it's not necessary. No, it's not. It's Some say yes, but uh, we 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 find that you know it's not about breaking down the proteins of the venom. Uh, it's more of a like a uh, pain modulation, so so to speak. Uh, because when we remove the heat, uh, the pain will come back again. Means that the venom is still probably still there. You know, uh, so it's more of like masking the pain with heat rather than uh, really destroying the venom that has already entered the body. Um, that may be true for maybe those uh, venom that is kind of uh, deposited quite close to the surface of the skin. But we have to understand that if let's say the venom is deposited through uh, a stinger or a fang deep into the tissue, heat on the surface may not reach the tissue to, to the temperature that is on the surface of the skin. So that again doesn't really explain why pain is controlled with uh, you know, deep-seated penetrating injury uh, from uh, stingers from, for example, stonefish and, and other uh, stinging fish. Okay, so heat label may not represent uh, the actual explanation uh, when we use heat uh, to, for example, we, we use like, you know, um, uh, um, uh, immer immersion in heat, right, in hot water. So that may not explain because it takes time for the heat to, to heat up the whole tissue <laughs> rather than the surface of the skin. So that doesn't really explain how heat uh, really control or you know, the, 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 the pain. Uh, definitely, I don't think it will destroy the protein, the, the, the venom, venom protein is already in into the tissue. Uh, yeah. yeah, the temperature uh, within the surfaces of the skin, uh, how deep it goes uh, when you apply uh, a, a hot water immersion. Okay. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Prof and Dr. Anas and other speakers.
I got one question here from an anonymous attendee. It says here that if any of us encounter a patient who eat unknown mushroom or plant, can we still call Pusat Racun Negara to gain information about the plant or mushroom and the antidote? Um, yes, definitely you can. But uh, I suppose there are several levels that you, you can contact. You can discuss with your emergency physician. Our emergency physician also has networked to our um, uh, toxicologists as well that we can discuss. And also we have contacts with the mycologists as well, uh, especially those in the university, I think. I, I think we've, we've uh, in UKM, pernah rasanya, kita pernah bincang, if I'm not mistaken, because this was a long time ago. In, 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 UM, in UM, I think. You, you am, yeah. But definitely, Pusat Racun, they have a vast uh, uh, information on mushroom poisoning as well. So, ada banyak uh, uh, platform that you can ask, actually. Pusat Racun, your emergency physician, network. Um, and um, I'm not sure. Do Does the toxicology team have something like Rex? That one, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe Dr. Sabrina can explain the step-by-step -step approach in, in how we process or what needs to be done when someone uh, come in with uh, poisoning from punch room. There's a, there's a standard procedure that we follow that includes sampling as well. Yeah, uh, I think first of all is the um, patient's management means that we have to stabilize the patient first before you make a call or uh, anything like that because uh, patient's uh, safety is number one. You have to stabilize the patient, resuscitate as per needed. And then uh, after that, uh, you have got the targeted uh, physical, targeted um, history taking, uh, physical examination and preliminary blood investigations. And um, to get the specific history with regards to the, uh, if let's say you are having a food poisoning uh, patient, so the history about uh, what did the patient consume, especially if the patient actually consumed the mushroom, the co-ingestion as well, and uh, all the specific things uh, that need to be included in the consultation with either clinical toxicologist or um, the Poison Information Center because the Poison Information Center, they can give you information, but if it is related to the clinical management, they have um, to discuss the cases with the uh, clinicians as uh, clinical toxicologists. So um, as the consultation uh, may comes from uh, various levels, so uh, the uh, uh, history, the physical examination, the investigation, and also if they have got any specimens, um, uh, I mean, if it's not the patient, but uh, if the family, me family members have got the specimens, whether it's cooked or uncooked, so they can actually brought the specimens of cooked or uncooked to the hospital. And uh, for the live specimen, uh, for the uh, fresh specimens, the one that they, they keep at home, so they can actually tap into a uh, in a um, paper bag and uh, give to the doctor, and the doctor who uh, has the consultation uh, with the toxicologist uh, may, may snap a few good pictures, and uh, they have ways to dissect the um, specimens as well. Uh, to be um, captured with a camera, uh, to be shown to the clinical toxicologist, and also uh, this information will be related to the mycologist. So for now, our uh, our partners is from the Mushroom Research Center in UM. Um, as for now, I'm not sure about others. Yeah, that's uh, and uh, we have to report right uh, to uh, Jabatan yeah. Kesihatan Negeri as well, and on also top, yeah. On top, of, on top of that, I mean, uh, you once you confirm that it is a food poisoning, mushroom poisoning, you have to fill in the um a poison. I mean, not notification, e notification, uh, and tick into the box of uh, food poisoning in bracket mushroom poisoning, so that your PKD site uh would actually uh alerted and they will investigate. Uh, what really happens, uh, and uh, if let's say we have got a cluster of cases, so they might need to actually uh, have some form of announcement in the social media or local uh, or through local authorities at the local uh, area uh, for them uh, to remind them not to actually in um, uh, uh, random mushroom at 
that area or nationally if it involves um, apa ni, uh, clusters that involve uh, multiple states, for example? Okay. This is like uh, from an anonymous attendee as well. It says here, uh, does we, uh, do we need IM entity for spider, antipid, or scorpion bites and stings? Okay, uh, this is actually, uh, I, I, got, I, I went through some literature and guidelines. Uh, some do recommend, some uh, uh, do, do not mention about the anti tetanus. But however, it actually should, should look at the, at the uh, uh, immunization status of the patients. Whether the patient has received any uh, booster or any uh, immunization recently. Uh, if not, I think for the uh, it it can be given. It should be given. Or any other opinions from the 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 I think this is the basic. Uh, Wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Allow if the patient actually being uh beaten by animal or even human bite can is uh, prone to tetanus. Yep. So uh, but. On, instead of actually uh, need giving IM AGT to everyone, I think uh, as a uh, um, uh, after this, maybe you would consider as what Dr. Anna said actually to ask a bit more regarding their ATT, IM AGT status for the past five years. Kalau unknown, kalau patient say is unknown, so you, you still can give the IM AGT because uh, you don't want the, your patient to present at the second time in a full blown tetanus, right? Uh, so uh, basic things are yes, bro. Yeah, so always, okay, for example, uh, yeah, our, our paramedic, especially when they come to the triage counter, they always just give without asking when was the last tetanus, and then they just give something without telling what they are giving. So, that is another thing that we should also uh, improve on. Whatever we give, we have to tell patient what we give. So that they know what they receive and they know the implication of it that you know that a booster ATT will last them for at least five years uh, to ten years, right? Uh, uh, okay. So, yeah, bro. Yeah. But to defend my teams, uh, usually patient doesn't remember. Uh, yes, but we have to tell them what we give and to, yes, to, to we'll educate do. them that the ATT will last them for five years for any other injuries after this animal bites or sting they don't need it uh, uh, after you have already given them for the next we'll do, five prof. years yeah it just said here like recently i read about toxic flower sea urchin may i know more about it basically the the most important thing is that you should um remove the spicule because that is the more often than not the cause of the um the infection uh when there is uh, a, a foreign body that is left behind like if it is not taken out properly and mm -hmm. so basic the, the basic wound care um and of course tetanus prophylaxis and um, antibiotics i would rather give them antibiotics because um we don't know the situation we're in the injury has been sustained you know the area and how how dirty his feet is, <laughs> foot is. Or the, um, usually you, you step on it right so more often than not um they are walking their feet barefoot so um i think that's one of the things that you have to take note of in terms of sea urchin injuries Okay, thank you, Dr. Emily. Okay, from Zuhilmi. For anthropod stings like hornet or centipede with local reaction only, certain hospitals give IV hydrocortisone as prophylaxis and to reduce swelling. Is this appropriate? Uh, I try to answer this actually. Uh, this is a concept of uh, managing uh, allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. Uh, uh, by right, if, if the patient has no risk of uh, previous uh, recurrent allergy reaction or non non asthmatic, but just a single sting or single bite actually with the minimal local reaction doesn't really require systemic uh, corticosteroid or, or systemic antihistamines. 
uh, but it's not a uh, routine not a uh, uh, routinely should be administered i think have to be based on the patient's background and also the type of uh, arthropods for example uh, if you got if you got sting by uh, a large number uh, a large number of hornets even though you just still develop a uh, local reaction but i will give because you know this is the magnitude of the 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 environment the potential environment or hypersensitivity reaction is high with this this high high amount of uh, sting or bites okay but to answer you yes uh, we don't recommend the routine uh, ib uh, hydrocort ib periton for all local reactions okay uh, maybe dr zainal can answer that question about uh if a patient was bitten by a snake that isn't common species in malaysia such as inland taipan hmm, is the management is the same as common species found in malaysia it's a bit controversial maybe the one who answer asking the question is keeping uh, a dangerous non-malaysian snakes uh, yeah Inland Taipan is Australia. Australia. Yeah. What about exotic snake designer? Uh, How okay. do we manage them? <laughs> thank you, Prof. Huh? So, uh, the, the first of uh, first of all, the management of snake bite, whatever the species is, uh, the flow of management will be the same. In which, uh, number one is uh, we, we have to um, uh, do a primary survey to look for any life threatening condition in, in 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 if there is any then we have to treat immediately uh, the second part is is actually um uh we we uh we don't recommend um any uh, the non evident based uh, pre hospital or uh, pre hospital care management like uh, uh tony k uh the different uh, then the, the management almost the same but the difference is uh number one is uh what are, we have to add we have, we have to uh, familiar with the sign and symptoms what the snakes uh the, the indigenous uh non-indigenous uh, snakes in Malaysia, what are the signs and symptoms that develop uh, due to the uh, venom and then um the 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 the, the the thing that it is um, uh, giving us a headache is actually those non-indigenous uh, snakes. We don't keep the antivenom in Malaysia, so we have to uh, try to find out uh, from other countries. Uh, so far, we have a few uh, two incidences. One is um, from the uh, rattlesnakes. And uh, number two is uh, the adder from the uh, African uh, uh, viper snake, in which uh, um, so actually we have to find out the appropriate antivenom towards the uh, specific uh, snakes. Uh, we don't, we, we cannot give the uh, so called the polyvalent antivenom that is available in Malaysia because even though those poly, it is called polyvalent but uh, the the um, the the um, the antibody of the uh, within the uh, the uh, polyvalent uh, antivenom is very specific to certain species of snakes in which we just keep those uh, indigenous in Malaysia we don't keep those non indigenous in Malaysia so the management number one uh, the basic management is the same Number two, we have to identify the uh, venom effect or the, uh, venom effect of the snakes itself, and we have to uh, look for the uh, need for the anti venom. And it, if if it is need, then we have to search for it over the world. Uh, so uh, number three is the supportive management. We have to do uh, supportive management while waiting for the anti venom is available. So the cause. Uh, so the most important thing is for those uh, who are keeping uh, non uh, non uh, indigenous snakes uh, in Malaysia. So number one, if you bring in those uh, foreign snakes, you have to bring in the anti venom as well with with the snakes. If not, uh, better not to keep the snake in Malaysia. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Zaina. Here we have one exclusive question from hmm. the question is what is the role of minyak cakapa for local reaction to a single bee sting? Can I have, can I have uh, any of our speakers or panelists to answer for this? Dr. Zaina, please. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, it's actually more of a pain modulating in which you just uh, feel a temporary pain, uh, pain uh, relief, but we don't really uh, recommend on that. Uh, uh, it is uh, just as, as uh, um, it's, it's non, uh, not a, it, even even if uh, it is, uh, uh, you know what is the content of Mia Chakapa? Uh, it is. Uh, it has a salicylate. Uh, if you are wrongly administered, uh, applied, uh, we are afraid that there's a potential that uh, uh, there's a salicylate poisoning or even. Uh, so uh, the role we, we it is not it is not a, a evidence based and it is not recommended. Thank you. Taida, mungkin nak respond. So uh, I'm sorry, bro. I have not experience that so good. Yeah. But uh, it, it may have a psychological effects because a lot of people use it for everything. So they have it, you know, they think that it works. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Sabrina? Mm, okay, so if, if uh, um, this is a question from Dr. Faisal. So uh, I think it depends on whether the patient is a... Uh, um, pediatric patient uh, with a small um, body size and body uh, with large body surface area or uh, an adult because if let's say a single sting uh, and then um, use uh, for the uh, pediatric population we must be very careful as if let's say it is actually being applied to the neonates we are afraid as what we mentioned before the salicylate um, intoxication or salicylate poisoning but however if a single use uh, i mean single uh, bite uh, for the human i mean if it is applied then probably the salicylate poisoning is not a consideration but having said that actually i didn't encounter any uh, effect of uh, salicylate salicylic acid causing reduction of the uh, pain in a in a i mean ornate or whoops thing for now, yeah, I mean that that's that's the thing, right? If you for you to get that type of poisoning, you have to apply a lot and maybe for a long time. But for a single uh, sting, uh, acute incident, it may not uh, cause uh, salicylate poisoning, right? Uh, unless of course you drink it. Uh, but but uh, what we are minyak chap kapa is a what we call minyak angin is uh, we have to know what is the content of it lah. So it it actually contains uh, menthol about 16%, eucalyptus oil, about 15%, methyl salicylate, as Dr. Zainal said, uh, about 15% again, and uh, camphor. So that's the smell that we get, right? The, the relieving camphor uh, smell. So those things are all relieving kind of uh, oils in the, in, in the concoction. Uh, but some of it contains uh, some anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, comp uh, capability that from the oils, so that may help in, let's say, for example, single sting from animal that cause like a so small wheel. Uh, but what we don't want is people to mistake that sting from bee, which your reaction is an allergic reaction uh, or an uh, anaphylactic reaction. But you, you try to use uh, even from single sting, from single sting from. Uh, what we call repeated uh, from previous history that you are already known that you are allergic to bee sting and you try to apply this may not be uh, helpful because you will already trigger uh, uh, your mast cells uh, to react uh, anaphylactically. So uh, sometimes using this oil may be masking what the true issue is, which is uh, your anaphylaxis. So that's why uh, even uh, for single sting, if you're already uh, known to be allergic to a bee sting, uh, it's best to just go to the hospital as soon as possible uh, because you may develop anaphylaxis. Okay, and that uh, uh, minyak chakapak will not be helpful in that event. 
But it's true, if you have no known history of uh, anaphylaxis, single sting from a bee may not amount to uh, much of an issue. It's more of a local uh, reaction. Yeah, that one is you can try. Even in the, our guideline, if you look at the VAPA guide, uh, uh, single sting may not amount to, to be considered as uh, significant envenomation. Okay, so uh, that can be treated uh, pre, uh, uh, pre hospitally. Okay, all right. I hope that answered the question. Thank you so much, the Prof and Dr. S. Before we end, can I just because I already tekan dekat to answer online. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Question from the Prof, I uh, think, what is the name? It's Prof Prayadong at University Chula Longkorn. Oh, what, okay, okay. I see the answer to the question. Uh, what management between length snake and uh, sea snake? Uh, is it any difference? Yes, uh, obviously, because the sea snakes, uh, the treatments, the antivenom is different as compared to the, the other snakes uh, that, 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 we had, that we have. But just, just uh, some tips, the sea snake and venoming sometimes can be, uh, because the local effect is usually very minimal. It doesn't have any skins. Uh, cytotoxic uh, reaction very much. So they can just progress to, to neurotoxicity uh, and even later with biotoxicity. So you need to monitor closely regarding uh, the, the signs of neuro uh, science and also uh, serial urine uh, anal anal analysis and also uh, renal function analysis. Watch out for uh, rhabdomyolysis. That is the different. And of course, the antivenom is different, and antivenom for sea snake is much, much more expensive. And the, the dosage also requires only one to three vials uh, 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 as compared to other neurotoxicity, and we give uh, five to ten vials uh, per, per dose. So the antivenom is uh, completely from a different manufacturer, right? The manufacturer of antivenom is different, right? It's from... Yeah, different. It's from uh, Australia. So, uh, can we use a uh, land snake antivenom for sea snake? Oh. Uh, uh, because the question is from Thailand, because Thailand is a manufacturer of antivenom as well, but they don't produce uh, sea snake antivenom. Uh, I'm not too sure about that, uh, uh, Prof. I'm not too sure about that. Okay, the answer is no. Huh? So that's the thing. Uh, in Malaysia, we we have uh, uh, have good experience with uh, sea snake and venoming, uh, where patient uh, was given the appropriate and also insufficient amount of uh, sea snake antivenom. Uh, so that's why I think I think in this region in ASEAN, uh, only Malaysia is uh, stocking up sea snake antivenom uh, from Australia, and Australia is the only country in the world that produces. Uh, sea snake antivenom. Same with Thailand, uh, they are the only country that produces uh, king cobra antivenom. So uh, uh, besides the king cobra, uh, they have other land snake uh, antivenom which we imported. Malaysia do not manufacture antivenom, so we have to source uh, out our uh, local need uh, from outside. Okay, so the usage is, uh, I'm not sure about Thailand, but uh, from what we heard before, they do not have many cases of sea snake and venoming. Or, uh, uh, but in Malaysia, we we have encountered several. Uh, if you look at the Rex uh, consultations, uh, Sabah, Sarawak, and also Semenanjung, uh, we have cases of uh, sea snake and venomation among mostly among um, uh, nelayan, among fishermen. So we and we have uh, given antivenom for them, and they respond uh, accordingly. Okay, but as you said correctly, said uh, the sign and symptoms that is required for us to monitor is basically the CK level for myotoxicity, rhabdomyolysis, uh, and also uh, clinical neurological ptosis is the early sign of neurological uh, envenoming manifested by seasonic uh, uh, envenomation. Okay. Uh, pain may not be so much, but pain may come a bit later when you have uh, myolysis. So uh, that is the different pain from the bite side, which we normally see from cytotoxic effect from, uh, for example, Naja species. Okay. Good question.
Thank you so much, Prof. And Dr. Anas. Now I would like to get back to our moderator. Close to you, Sarmi. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Isa, for all the questions. Hope everyone is clear and satisfied. For the remaining questions, we would like to request the panelists or the speakers to answer in the chat box. So let us wrap it up to the final session of Clinical Toxinology webinar today, which is the Kahoot session. The winners for our Kahoot today will be receiving the third edition book by Professor Madhya Dr. Ahmad Khaldun bin Ismail on land snakes of medical significance in Malaysia. So we would like to start the Kahoot. Everyone, please uh, get into the Kahoot link. All right, let's see the winner. Ting TH on the third, Shamim. Second and the first winner is Farah. Congrats, Farah. All right, so for all the winners, we will be showing a QR code after this. So I hope you guys can scan and submit your screenshots together. Congrats to all the winners. Before ending the session, I would like to welcome the president of Clinical Toxinology Webinar, which is Nurul Iza bin Dinamli, for the closing remarks. First of all, I would like to thank our head of the department, Hospital Chancellor Chris, the Vice Minister, for the opening speech, and our advisor for Program Clinical Toxinology Webinar, Prof. Adia Tamakalun, and our co advisor. While I'm having this opportunity, I would like to express my gratitude to the holders from Student Association Faculty of Medicine, National University of Malaysia, or better known as Satwan Mahasiswa Mahasiswa Faculty Perbuatan University Concept Malaysia, Pusat UK, and is our co organizer. Here we have Putri Noraisha as beholder and Muhammad Afif as co beholder. Not to forget our collaborator from embedded bodies that we have a representative from Remote Embassy Venomation Consultancy Services, Rex Ashen, Malaysian Society on Toxinology, MST, College of Education Special Group in Clinical Toxinology, Emergency Medicine Student Association, EMSA, National Poison Center, Dr. Rachel Navarro. Malaysian Association of Medical Assistance Mama. And last but not least, we have Chawangan Kehmatan Penolong Pembangunan Malaysia, C4P. Finally, yet importantly, all of our A schools and participants that have spent their day for the program today. Basically, saying thank you is sign up to capture the attitude I felt today. I hope today's webinar will be beneficial for everyone. It is really a good input from all our speakers and panelists. And I will be more than happy to invite all participants to join us in future, especially for our incoming professional video competition in the next three to four months. For any inquiry, feel free to email us through animalbite2.0 at gmail.com. I will put it in the chat as well. I think that's it for today. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, thank you, Meryl Isa. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank everyone who have involved directly and indirectly. Thank you to the panel, thank you, Prof. Thank you for sharing all the knowledge and skills. Not forgetting the committee members for engaging us with today, today's agenda. Most importantly, we, we would like to specially thanks to Professor Madhya Dr. Ahmad Khaldun bin Ismail as our advisor for the guidance throughout this program. Without his vision, today wouldn't have a reality. Thank you, Prof, for being our pillar. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end session of our webinar. I hope you have found today's webinar informative and useful. As per for the audience on the screen, there is two different QR codes that we will be showing after this. I hope you guys can scan both for the attendance and one for the ESA. All right, so thank you everyone once again for making this event a memorable one by participating and have a good weekend. See you next year.